Hi there folks and welcome to our latest edition of FU Friday. Now as we discussed in the previous episode, we didn't really know what the FU stood for. Well I think I figured that out with a lot of uh, recommendations, some in the comments, some personal, to associate those letters with each segment of tonight's episode. Our first segment tonight will continue with the theme from last week. We'll be discussing football. As I mentioned, I uh, play fantasy football with some of my colleagues from work. Oftentimes when I'm out with a group of friends and the subject usually comes up um, amongst those who tend to play this game, uh, there will always be somebody who pipes up and says, oh, I've, I've always heard about fantasy football, but I don't really know uh, what it's all about. And so we're going to dedicate the first segment of tonight's episode to explaining exactly what fantasy football is and to show you who I have on my team and, you know, have a little more discussion of, about that. So without further ado, our first FU of the night is Football University. Fantasy football is usually um, played amongst a group who has some sort of uh, social interaction or professional interaction. So colleagues at work or friends will get together in a group and uh, will play this game. Now the way it's set up hierarchically is first of all you'll have a commissioner. This is the person that runs the league. Typically the leagues average around 12 players, mainly because there's only so many um, football players to pick that are of quality that are going to uh, support the, the number of teams. When this game was uh, initially created and for many years after, uh, the commissioner's job was also to tally up all the points because this was all done manually. Uh, and we'll explain how the points are scored uh, later, but uh, with the uh, creation of many programs uh, by a lot of uh, the major sports networks and uh, organizations like that to uh, facilitate the the gameplay and the scoring. Uh, it's really taken off. It's uh, uh, become very very popular nowadays with the software. Basically. Uh, what happens is the league commissioner will go to whatever organization they want to uh, run the league from and will create an account, create a league, and within that league they have many, many options for selecting how the scoring will be done. Uh, for example, they have some leagues that are points per reception league, which means um, whenever a receiver catches the ball they get a certain number of points. And the number of points that are scored for certain things like field goals and uh, defensive plays uh, can vary as well. And again, the, the commissioner goes in and sets up all these rules and we'll discuss you know, how, how a lot of the, the points are tallied. Um, I know personally, as I mentioned last week, being from the Southeast and being primarily focused on college football, uh, the, this aspect of enjoying the game has really fundamentally changed the way I watch and the way I appreciate what's going on. Uh, instead of pulling for a team, you pull for your players. A lot more games than you normally would uh, and you're looking forward to next week to uh, pick your roster and, and uh, set who's going to play for you and uh, you know it just makes the overall, for me, the enjoyment of the season um, that much more. So the way the teams are initially set, what usually happens is the members of the league, the team owners, if you will, uh, gather someplace and take turns picking players. Uh, as you can see in this chart here, you have a finite number of players. Typically you have uh, a starting lineup and several members on the bench. Uh, you've got a quarterback, you have two running backs, two wide receivers, what's referred to as a flex player, which means you can put a wide receiver or a running back there, a tight end, uh, a defense, and a kicker. You have one, uh, one in each one of these slots that you pick, and then your bench players, usually you pick people who are quality players uh, who are act as backups in case one of your players gets hurt, or in case 
uh, one of your players teams is on a bye week you can swap them in and substitute them to um, include in the bye week so as I mentioned before usually uh, the group of friends will get together oftentimes in a bar or uh, at somebody's house or some other some other place where you have plenty of room to spread out and they will pick numbers so they, they don't know the order that they are on the draft and you will go through and select players now there's a lot of strategy for picking your players do you pick the you know the highest running back first do you um, move in a quarterbacks or wide receivers which which ones do you pick first and oftentimes because the value of the running back position is so great uh, typically those running backs are picked first followed shortly by the elite quarterbacks and then uh, maybe back to running backs and then elite receivers and you know you go through it and also the way the the the, the picking works is you start with if you're the number one pick uh, you pick 1 through 12, and then 12 picks again, and then it goes back up to 1. So it you know, goes back up and down the order. And where you pick in that list also has a lot of value. Oftentimes, the person that picks number 1 does not necessarily do that well, because while they get the choice of the best player overall, that they think is the best player overall, uh, they don't get to pick again until 23 other players have been picked. If you're 12, you only get the 12th best player, but you get the 13th best player too. I tend to like to pick somewhere between six and eight, so you get, um, you know, a fairly high, num you know, sixth rank player, and then 18. So you you get two pretty good quality players, you know, right around that that zone. Uh, once all the teams are picked, and they're all put in the system, uh, then the league manager generates. A schedule so it probably just pushes a button and the system automatically uh, determines what the schedule will be and the season usually lasts 12 games followed by three games of playoffs now the reason it's quite uh, sensible to only have 15 games overall even though it's a 16 game NFL season is because as you get towards the end of the year uh, especially the last game of the year if, if that game does not matter to a leading team they could bench some of their starters in that game and you know you don't get the quality of performance on your team so once you have your players picked then you have to start looking at things like who are each of these players teams playing this upcoming week are they the best matchup against that should I substitute uh, bench players in uh, things like that so there's a lot of strategy with setting your lineup because once the games start those players are locked in and you can't do anything to swap them out. So for example, if you've got a player in a slot that gets hurt in the first quarter of a game, you're SOL pretty much for that player. So basically when Thursday night, the first night of NFL games start and Sunday and then Monday night, all of the teams that play each other, instead of as you know most people normally do, root for one team, you're paying attention to all the games because you've got players on many, many teams, and you're you know you're watching. And instead of rooting for the team, you're rooting for your player to do well. And so it it broadens your appreciation of the you know, overall season, and it makes it more fun. Okay, so let's say we're watching a game. The game has the games have started. How are scores then tallied? Well, for the quarterback position, and these are my league's rules. Again, there are options for how they're done. But for every 20 yards the quarterback throws, he gets a point. If he throws a touchdown, he gets six points. And let's say he throws a 60-yard touchdown. Well, he gets three points for each of those 20 yards, plus six points for the touchdown for a total of nine points. But there's also penalties for things. If the quarterback throws an interception, it's minus two points. If he fumbles, it's minus two points. Uh, the next position on the list is the running backs. Uh, again, league rules vary, but typically running backs get a point for every 10 yards they run. If they happen to catch a pass, then the rules apply just like they do with receivers, which I'll tell you in a minute. Now again, if a running back fumbles the ball and it's lost, it's minus two points for them as well. For wide receivers and tight ends score the same way. For every 20 yards of receptions they get, they get a point. 
for every pass they catch, they get a half a point. And if they fumble the ball, they lose two points. Defenses, and actually special teams are combined with the defenses. Uh, it's, it's rather interesting. Defenses start out with 10 points. And they lose a certain number of points, however the options are configured by the commissioner. They lose points based on the number of points scored against them. But they gain points by getting sacks, two points usually, an interception, two points, a fumble recovery, two points. Or if they happen to intercept the ball or pick up a fumble and score a touchdown, they get six points. And also, again, this is also special teams, so if the, a team punts and your punt returner on your team runs it back for a touchdown, your defense special team gets six points as well. And finally, those left with the kickers. So when a kicker uh, kicks an extra point after a touchdown, they get one point. If they kick a field goal under 30 yards, they get three points. If they kick a 40 to 50 yard field goal, they get four points. And if they kick a field goal over 50 yards, they get five points. And again, these can vary based on the league. And so as the games are played throughout the, the course of the week, the points are tallied up. And once all the games are finished, whichever player has the most total points wins for that week. Now the standings for the league are set based on wins and losses. Currently I'm sitting at three wins and two losses. Uh, there are a number of other players who have the same record as I do, but how we're ranked is based on the number of total points we've scored. So that's pretty much the tiebreaker for people that have the same record. So for the playoffs, um, in a 12-man league, the top six teams make the playoffs. The first two teams get a bye the first week of the playoffs, which means they don't have to play anybody. And the third through sixth place teams play each other, each one eliminating the other in a single elimination tournament. Once those two winning teams move to the next layer of the bracket, then they play the top two teams, and then the winner of those two games goes on for the championship. And then that game is played in the 15th week, and somebody's crowned your winner. So as you see, it's quite a dynamic and very fun way to enjoy uh, the NFL season. And, uh, you know, I, I have a great time doing it. There's a lot of strategy. There's a lot of planning. You know, you feel a lot more tension watching a game which you normally would care nothing about. But, uh, you know, it, it just makes the season so much more um, enjoyable to me overall. There you go. Football University. Now you know about fantasy football. In our second segment tonight, I wanted to discuss something mainly because it's something that I noticed, and maybe being a 50-year-old, I should have noticed this before, but at lunch one day this week, I ate a bowl of asparagus soup, cream of asparagus. It was quite delicious. But I also noticed quite shortly thereafter, when I had to go to the bathroom, that when I peed, it smelled really funny. So the second FU for the night is funky urination. And we're going to talk about why your pee smells after you eat asparagus. I want to give credit up front to the details of this. Uh, I had to do a little research. I didn't know this off the top of my head. I mean, I, otherwise, why would I ask the question, why does my pee smell when I eat asparagus? So I'll give credit to the Smithsonian and smithsonian.com for the details of this particular report. So for a number of centuries, there has actually been documentary evidence of people reporting on the fact that asparagus makes their pee smell. In a book written in 1731 by a Scottish mathematician and physician by the name of John Arbuthnot, he stated that after eating asparagus, his urine gave off a fetid smell. And also in 1913, a French novelist, Marcel Proust, noted that asparagus made his chamber pot smell like perfume. Even Benjamin Franklin noted in a 1781 letter to the Royal Academy of Brussels that a few stems of asparagus eaten shall give our urine a disagreeable odor. 
But in that letter, he was trying to convince the Academy to, quote, discover some drug that shall render the natural discharges of wind from our bodies not only inoffensive, but agreeable as perfumes. To this day, of course, we know that that has not been accomplished. What modern science has accomplished, though, is explaining why asparagus has such an unusual and potent impact on urine. Scientists tell us that the asparagus urine link all comes down to one chemical, asparagusic acid. I'm not making that up. And when our bodies digest this vegetable, it breaks down the chemical into a group of sulfur-related compounds with names like dimethyl sulfide, dimethyl disulfide, dimethyl sulfoxide, and dimethyl sulfone. Not sulfone. Sulfone. And as with many other compounds that contain sulfur, such as garlic, skunk spray, and odorized natural gas, these sulfur-containing molecules convey a powerful and typically unpleasant smell. All of these compounds also share another characteristic. They're all volatile, which means they have a low enough boiling point where they can enter a gaseous state at room temperature. This allows them to travel from the urine into the air into your nose very shortly after you actually consume the asparagus, typically within 15 to 30 minutes. The funny thing is, this whole asparagus urine scent issue is complicated by another factor. Not everybody can detect it by the smell. Some people simply do not smell anything different in their urine after they've eaten asparagus. And this factor has actually divided the scientific community when they're, when they're doing studies on this, trying to determine the number of people that produce the smell versus the number of people. Not everybody does produce the smell. So on this basis now we understand that some people are producers, some people are detectors, some people I have discovered that I am both. As far as scientific studies goes, in 1956, a team of British scientists demonstrated that fewer than 50% of all people produced the odor in their urine. And they made the proposal that this possibly was determined genetically. Another British study that was done in 1987 also determined that the number was very similar to that. However, confusingly, other studies have found a much higher percentage of producers. For example, an American study done in 1985 put the number at 79%. However, another study done in America in 2010 as producers. Overall, though, it appears that scientists are now concluding that the lack of detection of the smell is really uh, a factor of the detectors and not the producers. So, if your urine doesn't smell after you eat asparagus, it's very likely that you are among those people that actually can't detect the, the sulfurous compounds within your own urine, rather than the small chance that it, your body is not breaking down these, these compounds um, like most of the other folks are. So there you go, the more you know. In my last segment on Friday, unfortunately, common interpretation of the initials FU. This uh, is a cringeworthy moment, one I will share with you uh, in order to exercise it from my conscience and maybe get a little laugh out of it because to be honest, this to me is not necessarily a face palm one. This is a, probably a face palm one for my mother, uh, if she even remembers it. I cannot forget it. But the thing is, this is one of those that whenever I think about it, it actually makes me laugh out loud to this day. I'll be in my car driving, it'll pop in my head and I will literally laugh. And it happened at a family reunion. We used to host a lot of family reunions at my parents' house and they would put a lot of tables out in the backyard and have a lot of beer on ice and whatever. And I had come home from college one time and uh, we had had a big reunion and uh, there was quite a number of folks there who uh, had come a ways and some of our older relatives were there which was amazing. 
Uh, and one of the people attending was my great aunt Kate. Now that is my father's aunt, my grandmother's sister. And we were, we were sitting around, we had already eaten and I had drank a couple of beers and just started talking, blah, 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 normal conversation and dropped an F-bomb. You know, whatever, 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 fucking something. And everybody at the table froze. It was like one of those still shots you see in movies or television where everybody just freezes. And I sat there and I don't really know how, I didn't laugh for sure because I knew my mother was absolutely mortified, but I didn't laugh. But in my mind, I have a picture of the face of my great aunt Kate when I said it. And it is the most hysterical expression just stunned, shocked offense. And I can't wash it away, but when I see it in my mind's eye, I cannot help but laugh out loud. So there you go, my final FU moment of the evening. It's a cringeworthy moment, but you know what? I can't help but laugh. That's it for this FU Friday. Thanks for uh, coming by and uh, sharing my video with me. Uh, if you're interested in seeing these things whenever I post them, just subscribe and they'll pop up in your list and uh, you can come back and visit me. Alright, you guys have a great weekend and I'll see you later.